to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. There's a question that is discussed in the literature of the sages of the Middle Ages, those figures we call the Rishonim. The question is, did the Jews fast during the Second Temple for the destruction of the First? In other words, once they had the Second Temple up and running, did we still keep Shiva Sarbatamuz and Tisha B'Av and all those days that commemorate the destruction of the temple. It is a discussion, in fact it is a machloket, it is a dispute amongst the sages. It's basically the Rambam against everyone else. The Rambam believes that, or he certainly says so in his Perush on the Mishnah, that the Jews fasted on Tisha B'Av during the second temple. All the other Rishonim climbing all over this, some even to the extent of wanting to change the manuscript of the Rambam because they can't actually get their head around it. Point is, we actually subsequently found original manuscripts of the Rambam where it's very clear that he believed that they did fast during the times of the Temple. I'm opening with that point because in many, many ways the Second Temple never ever matched what was going on in the First. But in other ways exceeded the brief of the first temple and did so magnificently. I'm hoping that tonight, I have spoken a couple of times before on Bayit Sheni, on the second temple period historically in this room, probably a year or more ago. Tonight I'm not just going to talk about the historical framework, I really need to focus on the temple. I'm interested in the historical background, the historical framework. We need to understand the consciousness of what it means for Am Yisrael to have a temple. Please God, we will have a temple soon. In order to properly realize our potential as a people with a spiritual focus in a house of God on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, we have to understand what was going on in those two temples and the mind of the Jewish people and the circumstances surrounding it and the function of the temple and so on. So I'm going to look at the historical period but I'm going to try and focus on the temple as much as possible. Why say the sages was the first temple destroyed last week? It was destroyed last week in this lecture. Not, not. Why? Sages famously tell us that the first temple was destroyed because of Avodah Zarah, Gilui Arayot, which is, you know, immoral, sexual depravity, and Shvichut Damim, the spilling of blood, meaning violent murders all over the place. Now, we saw that when we looked at the first temple, Avodah Zarah Haya, Gilui Arayot, there were plenty. In fact, most of the idolatrous practices that went on in the temple involved some form of sexual depravity. And there was no lack of shvichut damim. There was no lack of people getting up every once in a while and slaughtering everyone they knew. But the second temple, say the sages, was destroyed. Why? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. This is a learned audience, but I want to drive this further. Because of sinat chinam, groundless hatred. But let's look at the second temple. We're going to see that in the second temple, there was Avodah Zarah, there was Gilui Arayot, there was Shvichut Damim. But they took on a different form. The temple, the second temple, was a magnificent institution that was recognized around the world as the center of the Jewish people and as a place where the God of Israel could be worshipped by all nations. We will see that kings and world leaders were constantly sending gifts to the temple. It was a respected institution. We have to look deeper to understand. It's all very well, and I'm familiar, obviously, with the story of Kamtz and Bar Kamtz, as recorded in the Gemara and so on, but we need to look deeper at why Sinat Chinam was seen as an overriding theme throughout the second temple and what that means for us especially at a time now where we see certain sections of the Jewish world suddenly burst out with tremendous anger and tremendous hate 
And we have to ask ourselves, why is this? And is there something between that and what is related to the Second Temple? Everybody knows that the Second Temple was a very, very fractious time. There are splits that happened in the Jewish world that are still with us. There are splits that happened in the Jewish world compared to which what's happening today is nothing. But we will look at this, and I want to go into some detail. Now, we're in exile in Babylon, basically, by the time I want to open this. The temple has been destroyed. We've gone into a dark exile. And then the Babylonians are not around forever. At the height of their power, they are vanquished by the rise of the Persian Archimedes dynasty, starting with our chum Cyrus. Now, I'm going to do this timeline, and I'm going to very, very literally in seconds show you how the whole of Biogeny is mapped, because I want, don't want to do that as I go along. People are going to get confused. I'm going to do it from the start, and then I'm going to go back and I'm going to show you. That's going to be the end of Biogeny. That's 70 CE. And this is going to be the proclamation of Koresh, which we put at minus 538. This is the classic picture framework that we have of Biogeny. It's divided into four phases. Phase number one, that's the Persian. Phase number two, that's the Greek, or the Hellenic. Phase number three, which is about exactly a hundred years, that's the Hasmonean. And phase number four is the Roman. Once you grasp that picture, that's Baicheni in an absolute nutshell. In exile, we are a demoralized people. We're a demoralized people in the Babylonian exile because our God has abandoned us, or so we think. We have some incredible luminaries. We have the prophet Yechezkel. We have the promises of all the other prophets. We have some tremendous personalities and figures, Daniel and so on, in the Babylonian exile. But ultimately, we are a demoralized people. It was astonishing to us, as it was to many, when Cyrus got up, having vanquished the Babylonians, and was told about a people that lived in Babylon, and were in exile in Babylon, a people called the Yehudim, the Jews, who came from a land, a country called Yehuda. There are some parallels, but it's slightly different. It's not the case that Cyrus went, Oh, there's this people called the Jews. What am I going to do with them? We have to solve the Jewish problem. Let's put them in Uganda. Let's put them in the Kimberley. Where she went. Oh, Palestine. No. We were identified as a people with a land. We came from the land of Yehuda. That's why we were called Yehudim. Of course, we knew that we were called Yehudim from Yehuda because basically Yehuda was the tribal remnant of the whole of Am Yisrael. But we'd only been in exile for half a century and Cyrus said, you can go back. The famous Cyrus Cylinder that is still in the British Museum announces this to all peoples. But in a theme that is going to echo throughout the Second Temple period, Cyrus did this pretty much in conformity with an outlook about peoples and about gods. The God of Israel lived in Jerusalem. His people were in exile. They can go back and they can build the temple. Not to become a political entity. This was not Zionism. Even though some of our most magnificent literature comes from that period, Shir Hama'alod Beshuv Hashem et Shivat Tzion Hayinu Kechomim, we were so stunned and we were returning to Tzion. Nevertheless, it was about Cyrus gave us permission to come back and build the Beit HaMikdash. Political autonomy? No. The reconstruction and restoration of the Melucha, of the kingship? No. I'll give the vessels and the authority into the hands of descendants of the Davidic line, Yechonia's children and grandchildren, and they can lead the people back in this first Aliyah, but I'm not going to give them temporal authority to set up an independent kingdom. It was very much about the temple. That's the way the Persians looked at it. Nevertheless, he was prepared to fund the exercise. It wasn't just a permission, it was a serious sponsorship. So we come back. And as we know, and the leadership at the time is Zerubavel, who is a descendant of King David, he is the grandson of Yechonia, Zerubavel ben Shaltiel, 
as well as Yehoshua ben Yehot Sadak, the high priest, who was the grandson of the last high priest, the last Kohen Gadol of the temple, and we come back with a few thousand people. We come to Yerushalayim, and in a great wave of enthusiasm, we lay the foundations of the temple, and we set up a Mizbeach, we set up an altar on Har Habayit, on the Temple Mount. I need to remind people that Har Habayit in those days did not look anything like Har Habayit does today. First of all, you didn't need permission of the Waqf to go up there. You were allowed to pray when you went up there. Thing is, it was a dump. There was still charred and burnt debris from the deeply thorough Babylonian destruction. But also it didn't look physically like it does today. It wasn't this great big platform that we now know. The basis of that platform doesn't happen for another 500 years. That's Herod. It was actually still possibly even recognizable as its own individual hill called Har Moriah. And the temple stood on top of it. There would have been little habitations and buildings right around it, even on the east side, where we now know that the platform extends right out, basically almost to the drop into the Kidron Valley, there would have been... So it was a much smaller area, and it was distinct. We went up there, we laid a Mizbeach, and then basically we'd done that, and then enthusiasm started to wane because we got busy. We had an economy to run. We had people to support. We had to sow crops. We had to raise animals. We had to feed the population. We had an economy. We had social concerns. And all of this was extremely important. We had also been traumatized, still in collective memory, about the very clear fact that the prophets told us, the prophets Yirmiyahu and the prophets Yechezkel, that the whole reason that the temple, the first temple of course, had become destroyed, that Hashem had sent the Babylonians, is because of our over-preoccupation with that building at the expense of all other things, particularly social justice. So therefore, we weren't in a hurry to build it. We had the permission from Cyrus, we laid the foundations, but we got busy. It wasn't, of course until the Navi, this last generation of Naviim, we have some extraordinary figures, figures who really almost don't even belong in this era. They would have been immense spiritual figures at any time in Tanakh, but they come along. And that, of course, notably the prophet Haggai. And it is Haggai who sets the tone for the temple, because he says it's not about prioritizing the temple at the expense of society and it's not about prioritizing society at the expense of your spiritual focus the two go hand in hand for this society to be ideal and to be just it must have a spiritual focus but the spiritual focus only works when it acts as the center of a society that is striving towards justice and righteousness, but the two go hand in hand. We also had some very, very impressive prophecies. I mean, all of us know that the last eight, nine chapters of Sefer Yechezkel deal with the description of a very impressive building. And there were promises from every prophet, from Yeshayahu right through, going, when you return and rebuild it, it's going to be unbelievable. That's the Messianic age. That's going to be incredible. All the nations and the whole world is going to say, bada boom. And it just wasn't happening. So we were going, well, if that's what the temple's meant to be, well, we're not there yet. We can't really build that temple that Ezekiel tells us is going to be built. So it's obviously not meant to be built. God... Hashem says to the people through the Navi Chagai, you need a temple, you need a spiritual focus. Take a shtickle wood, go up on the mountain, and just build the thing. The Ertsev of Ekaved, I will like it, I'll be honored by it, it's okay. In fact, it is precisely that word, Ekavedah, I will be honored by it, that is missing a hay, that the rabbis tell us that hay stands for the five things that were missing from the second temple. That was another reason. We were a little bit disappointed. Some of us were so disappointed that we actually cried. And Hashem said, look, I know, I know. Those of you who remember the first temple, 
I know. It was very, very special. You had the Ark of the Covenant, we had the Urim, the Tumim, the sacrifices went up by themselves. Then he had to just put something on the Mizbeach and bada boom. I know. The Shekhinah was very, very present. It was a totally different type of arrangement. But now, this temple will still be magnificent and we'll see magnificent times, but it's going to be a bit different. Katsaf Hashem al Avotechem Katsev says the prophet Zechariah who is a contemporary of Haggai and explains to the people that the Babylonian exile has in a sense requited the social justice sins of the people particularly the non-observance of Shemitah Shemitah is the absolute basis of the relationship between Am Yisrael and Hashem and is the foundation of our social justice economy. We weren't keeping Shemitah and we were exiled for 70 years so that the land could make up its Shemitot. Zachariah says that, you know, you've got to be careful because the generations will quickly degenerate and in fact that's exactly what happened. They, Zachariah and Haggai, got the leadership going. They totally inspired. They got the people inspired. They built the temple. So the temple is basically, we understand, completed round about 516. Now, by the way, I know that those of you who are tired of me going on about this chronology issue, now that I've mapped it out like this, you can see exactly what we're talking about. The big debate versus Chazal versus the secularim is the fact that for Chazal in Seder Olam, this entire Persian period is contracted to 34 years. It's not just that everything shifts forward, it's that things have to be telescoped into here. It's an ongoing discussion, but we're going with the secular chronology. And just a word on that. People are welcome to stand up and leave after what I say. (laughs) You're welcome to stay as well. I need you to listen very carefully because people get in a lot of trouble in this town, in this day and age, for saying certain things in a certain way. Chazal are the pillars of the world. The job of Chazal, as is the job of the spiritual sages of any generation, is to transmit the Torah. That is the meaning of Torah le Moshe Misinai. We have an unbroken chain of transmission, which we're going to be talking about in the course of the Second Temple as well. But Chazal are allowed to make mistakes on matters of science and on matters of history. I'm not saying this. Many Gdolim from the Rishonim are saying this as well in a great variety of subjects. Chazal do not make mistakes in Halakha and even opinions that are not accepted within Chazal are called Divrei Lukim Chayim. But we must realize that we can't in the face of tremendous evidence blindly follow something just because Chazal said it if it's not in the realm of Halakha. Chazal are the pillars of the world. No, no one will be able to get me on how important Chazal are for the world. But we need to understand that sometimes we also have to think. At the moment, you know what? When we find out the Chazal were right and every single secular chronologist was wrong, I'll stand here and I'll be overjoyed to say I'm wrong. At the moment, the secular chronology looks like that's why I'm using it. I need to say that because there are some people who are still asking me, why am I using this? In our day and age, like now, I have seen other teachers intimidated by certain Das Torah views have suddenly switched their allegiance back to the Chazalic picture. I can do that with ease, but I don't want to because I'm holding out. I still believe that the evidence is stronger there. If you don't like it, write to me, tell me, or prove me wrong. Now, we build the temple at this period here. The generation devolves. We can't keep the high standards and promise that the expectations that were involved in the establishment of the second temple. The second temple, of course, by the way, we don't know too much about exactly what it looked like or how big it was. We know it was a modest building. In all likelihood, it was built from wood. One, because we have a prophetic verse from Haggai that tells the people to take wood and build it. And the second is, is that historians understand it was more likely to be built from wood. And that was part of the decree of Cyrus. He wanted them to build it from wood so that it wouldn't be difficult to destroy if he had to. 
Nevertheless, it was a modest building. The descriptions of the Beit HaMikdash that you will find in Masechet Midot, in Seder Kodshim, right throughout Seder Kodshim you'll find things about the Beit HaMikdash, particularly Masechet Midot and Masechet Tamid. Those dimensions and descriptions we understand were the Herodian Temple. That's a completely different picture. This, for the time being, was a modest structure. Now, I come back to what I said before. We were a religious entity. By the way, Yehud, as we were known in the Persian Empire, was not a terribly big area. The southern border was Hebron. The northern border was Beit El. The eastern border was Yericho. And the western border was probably not much further than Beit Shemesh. We weren't a particularly large entity. We were independent because for the purposes of the decree of Cyrus, which was, of course, subsequently confirmed by Darius shortly, you know, a few years later. One of the reasons, of course, that Darius had to confirm the decree was because we came under local pressure. The Samaritans, who, God bless them, have had an intertwined and interesting history with the Jewish people, came and said, No, was machst du? What are you actually doing here? And I said, oh, we got the decree of Cyrus. We're going to rebuild the temple. And they said, oh, can we help? While you've been in exile, we've been busy worshipping the God of Israel. So, you know, now that you come back to build the temple to the God of Israel, we'd like to be part of it. The Samaritans. They were primarily descendants of people that had been ethnically placed there in the great conflagration that had happened in the 8th century. Remember that the Assyrian kings had come and ethnically cleansed the north of Israel. They themselves claimed to have been placed there by the Assyrian king Eshardon, who I spoke about last week, the father of Ashur Banipal, and so on. So they, they had a shtickle yichus in terms of how they got there, but they wanted to be a part of this building project, and we said no. We said no because this decree was given to the exiles of Yehuda that were in Babel. We understand why this temple is being built, because we understand why the previous one was destroyed. We are those that are subject to that process. We are the ones who still maintain the tradition from our fathers about what this whole temple represents. You go and build your own temple, but you're not going to be part of this project. And they didn't like it. They got very upset and they started making mischief with the local rulers and eventually we had to write back to the Persian ruler Darius to get a full confirmation of the decree of Cyrus and that allowed the temple building to proceed. But that whole generation passes on and in a sense becomes degenerate. We fall into the old pattern of viewing the temple as some sort of locus of sacrifice, the Kohanim themselves, the priests themselves, are starting to get lax. You've got to imagine how magnificent it would have been in that generation when they first established the temple and they eventually dedicated and they dedicated it with a lot of sacrifices and the Kohanim would have come in. It would have been mind-blowing. It would have been magnificent to see the Kohanim come in in their clothes and their purity after 70 years of exile. We also sacrificed on that day 12 goats to symbolize the unity of the 12 tribes of Israel. We still regarded ourselves as the greater people of Israel. But as happens, generations devolve. The Kohanim became lax. Many of the Kohanim were married to local women who were, for want of a better word, not Jewish. We have two massive figures that I know you're aware of. Ezra, who comes from Babylon and He's followed by Nehemiah. Now, the whole story of Ezra and Nehemiah is fully contained in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. It involves a project of restoration and consolidation. On the one hand, Nehemiah was given the task of organizing exactly what... This, and by the way, this is reflective of how the Persians saw the whole project going on in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was an outpost colony of the Persian Empire. It had its own satrapy that sat in Syria. It was simply a temple project. It was a religious entity in this place called Yehud. Nehemiah was to organize it, consolidate it. He sorted out the walls. 
He divided up all the Kohanim into their proper stations. He basically enacted what was going to go on in the temple and what the order of things would be. But as part of that as well, and together with Ezra, they put a complete stop to intermarriage. It was in fact the threat of the possibility that the grandchild of the Kohen Gadol could become married to one of the descendants of one of the Sumerian tribes that in fact was the catalyst for Nehemiah to introduce into Jewish life the idea, not everyone agrees, but a lot of people think it comes from Nehemiah, the idea that Jewish identity will be passed down through the mother, originates from this period. But Nehemiah builds the wall, in fact he builds the walls in 52 days with thousands and thousands of volunteers. It's a tremendous job. Ezra, on the other hand, affects a far more spiritual restoration. It's not so much physical. Ezra brings with him the primacy of the Torah. Ezra, who has held back in Babel until his own teacher, Baruch ben Neriah, passes away, comes to the land of Israel and re-establishes the Torah as the central value in Am Yisrael. He has the Torah read several times a week publicly. He institutes all of those facilities. However, he also, and very importantly, and I don't need to go on about Israel because many of you are very familiar with his role, but he sets up an institution called the Anshe Knesset Hagdola, the, what they call the Synagogue Magale. We don't know a lot about the Anshe Knesset Hagdola. People, I can hear people saying, oh, well, well. look, the Anshe Knesset Hagdola were traditionally ascribed with having established the Tfilot that we now have, certainly the Amidah and the Order of Service. They made many other enactments. It was 120 people. That's why today the Knesset is 120 people. That's the Knesset Ketana. The Knesset Gedola was some historians are a little bit hazy about exactly when it was, but it was certainly parliamentary in nature. They enacted things, and they had to because we moved into a different phase of history. If you go with the Chazalic view of this period, and everything becomes contracted into here, then the Unshaken Estagdullah really lasted maybe one, maybe two generations. But in fact, this view shows that the Anshek Nestagdula is predominantly responsible for over 100 years, maybe 120 years, of internal governance of the Jewish people during the Persian period. The Persian period here is famously known by historians as the silent period. We don't know a lot about it, primarily because we are an outpost. We're busy. We've got an entire economy and society we're supposed to be retransforming. We have got a temple in which we're focused. We're a small, small space. We don't have any political autonomy or authority whatsoever. We have a few diaspora communities that are interesting. But there are a couple of things we do know about this period. And I'm only going to touch on them because they're not directly related to the temple itself. Famously, and I've spoken about this before, but I'll mention it again because it's worth knowing. During this period, we have another temple. No, this is another temple. It's not the first, it's not the second, it's just another temple. And that temple exists, of course, at a place called Yeb. And Yeb is today called Elephantini. It's on an island in the Nile near Aswan. It's called Elephantini because the shape of the island looks like an elephant's tusk. And we have one of the most famous archaeological discoveries of the 19th century, the Elephantini Papyri, which is a whole series over about a century of letters. See, what happened was, we had a Jewish community in Egypt. We had a Jewish community in Elephantini. When the temple's destroyed, we go into exile, we come back, decree of Cyrus, and so on. But Judaism is in a state of flux. We never had a diaspora before. We never had a diaspora. Go and ask someone like, you know, Uziyahu HaMelech in the times of the first temple. What do you think of the diaspora? 
he would say, what are you talking about? There are various theories about how Jewish communities ended up in Egypt, and many theories believe that they were remains of mercenary troops that were sent by King Menashe to affect whatever it was they were doing in Egypt, and obviously stayed there. We, right throughout recorded history, we have episodes where Jews are mercenary soldiers, and they help various powers, and when those powers either lose or win wars, the Jews, who are those mercenary soldiers, say, this is a very nice place, I will think I'll stay here. That happened in Egypt. We had a growing community, and they built a temple. There are letters back and forth. What are we supposed to do on Pesach? How do we do this? What do we do that? Now, it's very clear also that the Kohanim, the priests back in Yerushalayim at the temple were very, very unimpressed by this project. They didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. We have a very, very strange episode that really we only know about from Josephus and maybe some hints from other places that at a certain point, Josephus doesn't give us an exact date because Josephus' own chronology is unique, but we assume somewhere around about 400 we know, even from outside Josephus, that the temple at Elephantini, the temple at Yeb, was destroyed. And they wanted to rebuild it. And they needed permission from the Persian satrapies to rebuild it. And they wanted also the support of the Kohanim in Yerushalayim. It just so happened that this all happened at a time where the Kohanim in Yerushalayim during the Persian period... Now, what I'm about to say comes from Josephus. You'll find it in the Antiquities, I think in chapter 11. It's a very, very obscure thing that's going on. But one of the Kohen Gadol murdered his brother in the temple. We start to see the signs of dissent and cracks and political struggle and intrigue within the second temple structures itself. As a result of which, to punish them, taxes were placed by the Persian governors on the sacrifices. The Persian governor actually walked into the temple. He was told, you can't do that. He said, what, am I any less pure than the high priest who just killed his brother? And they gave permission for the temple of Elephantine to be rebuilt against the wishes of the Kohanim in Yerushalayim. But these are issues to be aware of, but bear in mind that this is a very, very obscure period. But we do have records of it. And then, as I'm so fond of saying, everything changes. Now, there are these people who have been undergoing their own historical processes called the Greeks. Now, they'd already gone through a series of internal struggles and civil wars, and they also came up against the Persian Empire, and there have been battles and there have been skirmishes, but also the Greeks have gone on to develop not only themselves as a political entity, but undergo tremendous intellectual and cultural processes that give rise to an entirely new way of looking at the world. They had developed a massively different culture, a culture that saw themselves as enlightened politically, scientifically, artistically, in philosophically, in every possible way. The Greeks were massive. Don't underestimate the Greeks. We all live in a post-Greek world. If it wasn't for the Greeks, there wouldn't be that light there. I know that's a radical statement, but the whole project of Western science really emerges from this Hellenic engagement with reality. I have spent ma on many occasions talking about the difference between Hellenism and Judaism. I'm not going to do that again. I'm going to try and summarize that. As you know, I'll get onto it in a second, because I just want to come back historically, because we're chuffing along. We've got the second temple. It's all contained. Persia is the world for us. By the way, what's been going on in Persia? What's the big religion in Persia by now? Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism, which more or less starts off around here, is already rising and rising, has affected several revolutions. By the way, as I'm so often fond of saying, Zoroaster is here, Buddha is here, Confucius is here, Socrates is here. So we're in the second temple, but the world is undergoing a tremendous intellectual and cultural transformation in a great variety of places. The Acropolis in Greece was built here. This, of course, is the advent of Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great completely changed the world. 
He completely changed the world. It's not just that he dominantly conquered everything in the space of about 10 or 12 years. He brought with him the whole Hellenic outlook. Now, I, as I said, I've spoken about Hellenism before, its contrast with Jewish perspectives and the Hebraic tradition. One of the things that I want to talk about that relates directly to Yerushalayim and the subsequent history of Yerushalayim and the temple is the fact that Alexander brought with him the idea of the Greek polis, not the Greek police, the Greek polis, the idea of the city-state. Wherever Alexander went, his dream was to set up city-states all over the known world. He established several. Now, a Greek city-state is not quite a city, and it's not quite a state. It's something unique. That famous sentence that you all know from Aristotle that everybody likes to quote, you know, man is primarily is, is a political animal, right? Really, if you read Aristotle, he actually says, man is a being that lives in a polis. The ideal polis, is Plato, is about 5,000 people. And always bear in mind that 5,000 people actually probably means more like 50,000 because there's 5,000 people, but there's probably, they're just men, free men, and on top of that you'll have, you know, X amount of women, of course, and children supported by a massive underclass of slaves who don't count as people. So always remember that when they say an ideal polis is 5,000 people, there's probably about 50,000 humans living there. But the polis is a political entity in which people partake and realize their true nature through engagement with the political system. They have rights. This is where we talk about the birth of democracy. It's not really a democracy that we would recognize today. It is Greek democracy. It is the polis. Well, in fact, not even democracy as far as Aristotle, because Aristotle saw democracy as ruled by the mob, which is much closer to today. Alexander is establishing the polis everywhere he goes, but Alexander dies. His conquests, and remember, here's the Mediterranean, dazzling in pink. That's Spain, as you know. That's going to be Italy. That's Greece. That's Turkey. There's the land of Israel. Babylon, Persia. There's North Africa. So basically, Alexander conquers in around 330, between 330 and 320 BCE. Alexander conquers basically that. Well, even further, almost to India. Now, when he dies, therefore, his massive conquests are divided up famously amongst the Diadochi, amongst his generals who divide it up. They take care of his kids and they just divide it all up for themselves. We're concerned with two. We're concerned with Seleucus. Now, Seleucus takes that and Ptolemy, who takes that, takes Egypt. Ptolemy, of course, is one of the Sumatophilakes, one of the bodyguard, the seven privileged bodyguards of Alexander, massive hero and soldier in his own right. Seleucus, who ended up to be Seleucus I, Nicator, huge conqueror, would have probably gone down in history as a big dude even without Alexander. But those two, his two, two of his biggest chaverim, they start carving it up, each of them in their own way eventually perceived themselves as more than just a king. Each of them, in a way, made themselves divine within their own province. Each of them established their own dynasties. So, in other words, in Egypt, for the next 300 years, all the kings are known as Ptolemy. I said Ptolemy to show you that it's written Ptolemy. So Ptolemy the first, Ptolemy the second, Ptolemy, with the occasional queen known as... Cleopatra. So you either had kings called Ptolemy or queens called Cleopatra. There were a number of Cleopatras. The famous Cleopatra is just the last Cleopatra. Then in here, you had a similar thing. Certainly for the first while, there was Seleucus I, Seleucus II, and so on. The Hellenic worldview was deeply pervasive in both of these realms. And we were totally stuck in the middle. It's not like we could align ourselves with one versus the other. They were both very, very from Hellenic dynasties. The Hellenic outlook focuses upon external values. Harmony, beauty. It is the search for things like truth. It is about what we can see. And the Hebraic tradition is much more about what we have heard. 
Shema Yisrael. Here and what are we told to listen to? A concept that the Greeks didn't really have. The concept of good and evil. The concept of right and wrong. Their entire perception of the gods was different from our understanding of the divine. The gods were highly reified divine principles that were basically like human beings, only perfect. And they would come down and do their things and go up and do their things. We, the God of Israel, had a special covenant with the Jewish people that was founded upon our behavior in a, towards God and towards our fellow human beings in a certain way that was predicated upon righteousness and justice. Now, those two ideas don't necessarily have to totally conflict. They can coexist, and they did coexist. And what we're going to see in the Second Temple is the massive attempt to synthesize those two ideas. But they are fundamentally different. A Greek person, when he wakes up in the morning, is very, very impressed with himself. His body, his mind... This body that can run around in the nude and do all these incredible things. It can swim, jump, climb, run, throw a spear. It, there is an ideal, magnificent physique that you can attempt to attain. There is an ideal for the human being. And in fact, the human being, and even more specifically, man, is the central value of all things. And you know what happens when a Jew wakes up in the morning. <laughs> says Modani and then, you know, groans a bit and goes off to Daven. All right. But of course, the Greeks were very big in their polis about establishing certain fundamental institutions within each polis, whether it's the Lyceum, the Agora, the Gymnasium, all of these things had to be in place. I'm going into this so that you understand that when we came under the control of the Greek states, we came under tremendous cultural pressure. I'm not talking about children's stories here. All of us, when we were young, learnt about the Hashmonaim, we're learning about the story of Hanukkah, we think, ah, oh, there were Greeks. There was massive, massive pressure. This entire century here, from 300 to 200, about exactly 100 years, you know, after Alexander, Ptolemy came in, by the way, I mean, when Ptolemy the first came in, it wasn't like, you know, he just said, can I have the land of Judea, please? Now we're known as Judea. We were Yehud under the Persians. Now we're Judea under the Greeks. Can I have, please have Judea? No. Ptolemy came under the pretense that he was going to offer a sacrifice in the temple. Remember, that's what kings did. One of the conditions on which the whole of the second temple was decreed by Cyrus and subsequently by Darius was that a sacrifice would be offered on behalf of the temporal ruler every day. Ptolemy comes in, he wants to make a sacrifice in the temple. He enters in on Shabbat, and once inside the city, and once going towards the temple, his soldiers just wipe out thousands of people, and he takes Yerushalayim. Ptolemy was not what you and I would regard today as a nice person. He was a very, very big king, historically, and he established the whole of the Ptolemaic Empire, but his taking of Yerushalayim was pretty much by force. But for the next hundred years, we are a basketball going back and forth between these two dynasties, the Seleucid dynasty and the Ptolemaic. Back and forth, most of the time in the grip of the Ptolemaic dynasty. That, of course, and not necessarily directly related to the temple, is the period under Ptolemy II, probably the middle of this century, that, of course famously, we create with the Ptolemies one of the most important and classically Hellenic documents of the age, which is none other than the translation of the Torah into Greek. This was a tragic day for the Jewish people. Please bear in mind, every time you pick up your art scroll translation and weep over it, that that wouldn't exist and I make no secret about what I think of the Art Scroll Translation, all of you are aware of that, <laughs> that the Art Scroll Translation and its Chaverim wouldn't even exist yeah. if it wasn't for the fact that this plunge was taken during the Hellenic period and specifically under the Ptolemaic request, could we please provide 
them with a translation to Greek of our most precious cultural artifact. There are scholars, there are historians who speculate that it was actually an answer to some anti... This will come as a massive shock. But during this period, there were anti-Semites. Some of them, like the historian Matheno and so on, were saying that the Jews come from Egypt where they were kicked out by the pharaohs because they all had leprosy. So we were asked to provide our own account of all that, and we translated the Torah. All right? But that was the beginning of the end as far as the genuine coexistence because we have paid for those translations in blood many, many times. The Torah was never meant to be translated. All right, I'm not going to get on my soapbox about Hebrew now. But by around the year 202 BCE, this struggle between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies comes to an end here because the Seleucid dynasty finds itself a really big leader. An ambitious leader. A guy who wants to see himself as the rival of anything going on in the world. And of course, there is something going on in the world, because there's a new power. And that, of course, is Rome. Remember that one of the things that Alexander did, one of the massive things he did, was the fact that until Alexander, everything that we thought was interesting in the world came from the east. Apart from maybe Egypt to the south, but everything, whether it was Assyria, whether it was Persia, whether it was any of our neighboring nations, everything, everything, suddenly after Alexander, there's the West. And now here is Europe. First of all, Greece. Rome is at the height of its republic and its flexing muscle. The leader of the Seleucid dynasty, King Antiochus III, sees himself as capable of establishing a society and empire to rival Rome. There's no question that he wanted to be the balancing power in the world to Rome. Rome is starting to expand in big directions. Hannibal, don't forget, Hannibal had tried, you know, on behalf of Carthage to conquer Rome. In fact, when they beat Hannibal, he had to hide with Antiochus III. Antiochus III is a big supporter of the temple. He pays extensively for renovations of the temple, but more specifically for the upkeep of korbanot, of sacrifices, of supplies. He even enacts, because we're under the control of the Seleucid dynasty, he enacts decrees that the inhabitants of Judea must observe Mosaic law as told to them by the priests in the temple. He forbids any animals that are unfit from coming into Jerusalem. He is a massive friend of the Jews. That's what makes it so astonishing. He fights a very, very fierce battle with Rome. And he's beaten. And Rome is worried about the expansion of Antiochus III. And they put a stop to his activities. They warn him. They say, you can carry on in your own little fiefdom here, but don't start getting expansionist ideas. We don't want you in Egypt, and we don't want you here, because we're Rome, and frankly, that's too threatening for us. It's very much a cold war going on between the Seleucid dynasty at its height under Antiochus III and the growing Roman Empire, or growing Roman sphere of influence, because it wasn't an empire at this stage, it was still a republic. In order to ensure his cooperation, the Romans took... Antiochus III's son as hostage. He gave him to them upon request. He also agreed that he would have to pay massive reparations to the Romans. Now, we can begin to understand the psychology of Antiochus IV by understanding the effect that it would have on you if you were given by your dad to your enemy as a hostage until he could afford to buy you back. Eventually, Antiochus III is killed. He's killed because he has to find a way of paying the Romans the immense amount of money that he had promised them and he starts looting temples all over the place and eventually that's not an exercise that is conducive to someone's health and he is killed in Elam, in northern Iran, robbing a temple there. Well, I suppose we should be grateful he didn't come and rob our temple but he robbed a whole lot of other temples. Hovasham, back and forth, various leaders of the Seleucid dynasty, and eventually we get this dude called Antiochus, his son, who eventually, having come back from Rome and had to seize the throne again, 
Antiochus the fourth. Antiochus the fourth, who famously referred to himself as Antiochus Epiphanes, the enlightened one. Many people called him Antiochus Epimanes, the mad one. Chazal know him by only one designation, Antiochus Harasha, the wicked. It is amazing. The Antiochuses had a policy of religious toleration everywhere. Antiochus IV's decision to eradicate Judaism is unique. It's not that Antiochus IV was running around here, there and everywhere trying to Hellenize everyone. It was specifically located against us. And it happened here for a variety of reasons. But primarily, he had made an expansion into Egypt and the Romans had said, just like we said to your dad, no. And he was very, very upset. And on his way back, he decided he would take out his anger on the Jews in Jerusalem. And he established the Akra, which was a garrison of Greek soldiers, you know, Seleucid soldiers of Greek inclination. And he turned Jerusalem into a polis. In fact, it was no longer called Yerushalayim. It was called Antioch. I know there's another Antioch up here, the famous Antioch, but this was Antioch at Yerushalayim. That, of course, was a very, very bad thing. As far as we were concerned, our entire spiritual and cultural identity was literally being ripped out from underneath us. The famous stories, back and forth, the tremendous corruption and Hellenization of the priesthood Bekitzur Nimrat, in tremendous brevity, we got to the situation, as you know, where two high priests are vying with each other for the job and vying for Antiochus the fourth appointment of them as high priest. Jason and Menelaus. It does sound like a Homerian epic, but that's actually what their names were. Jason goes and says, if you make me high priest, I'll build you a gymnasium in Jerusalem. Fine, you be high priest. Menelaus comes along and says, Gymnasium, Shmimnasium, you make me high priest and I'll basically open up the doors of the temple treasury to you and you can have as much as you want. So Menelaus comes in. They think Antiochus is dead for a while. Jason comes along with a force. Antiochus hears about it. He comes out back. Massive, massive mess. In the meantime, Menelaus, who's trying to impress all his fellow Hellenists, in the temple, says, why actually are we offering uh, these type of sacrifices to the God of Israel? Pigs are perfectly good animals. Let's sacrifice pigs. Now that we're sacrificing pigs, why are we actually sacrificing these pigs to the God of Israel? Why don't we sacrifice pigs to Zeus Olympus? So we arrive at the situation in around 166, 165, where the temple is being used to sacrifice pigs to Zeus Olympus. It's not entirely kosher. And of course, the massive rebellion. I want to tell you something. Everybody's familiar with the Hasmonean rebellion, which of course started in Modi'in and uh, Matit Yahu, Kohen living in Modi'in. He's got some sons. They're part of a whole new rebel movement called the Hasidim. They're aligning themselves with the authentic traditions of the Jewish people. He comes along. He schmeisses a guy on behalf of Antiochus to offer a sacrifice in the town. And it's the rebellion starts. Yehuda, the oldest son, gathers towards him a guerrilla force that starts with only 600 men. For the first year, they did nothing. They did nothing. It's brilliant. If you go into detail on the warfare of the Maccabeans against the Syrian armies that were sent, and there wasn't just one, there were waves Apollonius and Gorgias and Nicanor and Lysias and all these other waves. And each time they would get defeated. Brilliant, brilliant tactics that we now know a lot about because now we're late enough in history. We actually have the details of exactly where these battles were fought and what Yehuda's tactics were on each occasion. Each time his army grew and grew, but they did nothing for a year. For an entire year, Yehuda said, all we're going to do is gather intelligence. They studied deeply exactly how the Syrian Seleucid armies worked. They worked, of course, according to 
as most of the really, really cool armies and effective armies in the ancient world worked. They worked according to the idea of the phalanx. That is, you have a great big square, basically, comprising thousands of men with shields and arms, and they would march like that, you know, unstoppable. But he managed to stop them, harass them, and he did that primarily how? Using the actual geography of the land of Israel as a weapon. How he would trap them in valleys and on hills and on paths and through passes. It was incredible. Every single battle was a tremendous result of intelligence and thinking. Eventually, much to the astonishment of the Seleucids, who had literally tens of thousands of professional soldiers, they recaptured the temple and, of course, they created the festival of Hanukkah. Yeah. Hanukkah, by the way, is not the miracle of Hanukkah. Some people think the miracle of Hanukkah is the light lasting for eight days. That is not the miracle of Hanukkah. The miracle of Hanukkah is the military victory. Please bear that in mind. It was so astonishing. It was so phenomenal. And they established the Hasmonean dynasty. Now, it wasn't an establishment of a dynasty. It sort of grew out of Yehuda's victories. Yehuda, of course, was eventually killed in 162. But the leadership passed to his brother Yonatan. Bear in mind that the wars with the Syrian, the wars with the Seleucids coming down, carried on for the next 30 years or so. It wasn't just a one hit. It wasn't like, oh, Hanukkah and everything's fine now. It carried on for the next few decades. Amazingly, and I really want to make this point. If you remember one point from this talk tonight, I want you to remember this, because it's a fascinating historical fact, but it exemplifies the whole attitude that the Hellenics had towards us. Okay, so Yehuda 162 passed to Yonatan. Yonatan for the next 20 years until 142, gradually eking out a form of independence, expanding slightly, and then it wasn't really until it passed on to Shimon, the, other, the last of the brothers, for about eight years, from about 142 to 134, before it passed on to the next generation, and Yochanan Hirkanos, but Shimon was the one who really got the independence, because in 140, we were no longer paying taxes to the Seleucids, who'd eventually arrived at some sort of truce with us. By 138, we're minting our own coins, we're fully independent. But there are still attempts by the Seleucids to try and grab back Yerushalayim. In the 130s, under Shimon, Antiochus VII, comes with a big army and lays siege to Yerushalayim. Incredibly original idea, lays siege to Yerushalayim. I've never thought of that before. What's really amazing about Antiochus VII is that he's sieging Yerushalayim for about five months. We're holding out. While he's sieging Yerushalayim, he offers a korban. He offers a sacrifice at the temple. Now I know that we could look and go, well, what? Because the Greeks' view of it all was this. Just because I'm ravaging and pillaging and destroying your entire society doesn't mean I can't respect your God. In fact, because I'm ravaging and pillaging your society, it's probably a good idea that I appease your God with a sacrifice. Your God. That's the whole world view of the Hellenics. We are Yehudim. We come from a place for Yehuda that Cyrus was told about, where this people was given a project to bring to the world the idea of a universal monotheism that demands ethical and moral behavior. There is no separation between the temple and society. The Greeks had an entirely different view. It's okay to slaughter a people and offer a sacrifice to their god. Eventually, that siege from Antioch the seventh was beaten back, and eventually we get into the whole realm of Yochanan Hirkanus, who is basically Arik Sharon on crack. Yochanan Hirkanus goes smash, 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 and he conquers this and he conquers that. He takes a bordering nation called the Idumeans, the descendants of Edom, in around the year 130, and he forcibly circumcises them, throws them in the River Jordan, that's the quick Miller and Mikvah process, and says, you're now Jewish. Okay, we're now Jewish. But they were never really accepted. By the way, that's very important, 
in terms of diaspora communities, already by this stage, the diaspora communities that were growing in Alexandria and in Rome and in other places, what happened was, is with the conquests of Alexander and the other Hellenic conquerors, when they conquered a place, everybody in that place would be granted citizenship of the Greek city-state, including the Jews. But that didn't apply to people who arrived afterwards. So after a while, you would develop primary and secondary populations of Jews within places, some of whom were citizens, some of whom weren't. This started also to cause discontent within diaspora communities. Similarly, when the Idumeans were conquered, they were made like a sort of second-class Jews. They might have even been warned that if they don't keep mitzvahs, their conversion will be revoked. <laughs> Yohanan dies, Aristobulus, you had Aristobulus for a year, his son, and of course, <laughs> during that time, the Hasmoneans were starting to look unpleasant. They were starting to copy many of the practices of oriental despots around the region. They didn't exactly follow what it meant to set up a society based on Torah. By the time we get to the end of the career of Yohanan Hirkonus, he is already aligning himself with factions that are at odds with the sages of Israel. And the sages of Israel had constant, who were now, who had gone through various manifestations. It is not the case. You know how some people say, ah, oh, how come we don't hear about Orthodox Jews before the 18th, 19th century? Right? You all know the answer to that. Because before the 19th century, there were no Orthodox Jews. There were just Jews. Orthodoxy is a description given to people who adhere to a halakhically based lifestyle following the eruptions of the Enlightenment into Jewish life. Similarly, when we talk about the rise of the Hasidim and then the Prushim, we're talking about designations of people that adhered to what had always been the traditions of the Jewish people. But more and more, the Hasmonean leaders, Yochanan Hirkanos, Alexander Yanai, were moving further and further away from these traditions. Remember, Yosef ben Yoezer had already been martyred way back here. We now have some tremendous purges. We'd sit the Anshekhnes Dagdula through the Gerusia and then finally the Sanhedrin had involved into a body parliament of 71 sages, but it was Sadducee dominated. That Stukim had arisen as a class, a leadership aristocratic class of Kohanim that were running the temple. They had a full grasp on the temple. By the time you get to Alexander Yanai and his massacre of the year 90, when he came to the temple and was pelted with Etrogim and turned around and slaughtered the crowd in the temple and then set about a purge of the Prushim, we lost an entire generation. Although it just so happened, fortunately, for the Prushim that Alexander Yanai's brother-in-law was Shimon ben Shatach. Shimon ben Shetach eventually worked through the Sanhedrin to have the Tzutukim placed with the Prushim the day that they got rid of the Sadducean penal code. Remember, the Tzutukim did not believe in Torah Shabal Peh. They didn't believe in the oral Torah. They were imposing the Lex Talionis. You all know what the Lex Talionis is. That's the eye for an eye. That's Ayin Tachat Ayin. They read it literally. And people were just wandering around with one eye broken out. Blah, 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 right? The day that they rejected that in favor, of course, of the ancient oral law tradition that it's talking about monetary compensation was a hug. But they eventually, this struggle between the Sadducees and the Prushim that I wish I had more time to go into never really went away. I have amazingly run out of time. Alexander Yanai, of course, dies, as most people do in the ancient world, eventually. And he succeeded by his wife, Shlomtzion Hamalka. As I've said before, Shlomtzion Hamalka is a reign of nine years in which everybody was chilled, everybody was happy. It is complete proof that the Jewish people were never meant to have kings, we were meant to have queens. The Pharisaic and Sadducean factions were at peace with each other. Everything, in fact, even nature itself reflected the tremendous shalom, the tremendous peace that was dwelling in the temple and in the people of Israel at the time. Unfortunately, that situation completely disintegrated with the death of Shlom Tzion Amalka in around about minus 67. Her two sons, her two ambition sons, became locked in a civil war which was effectively centered over the Temple Mount itself. A civil war 
over control of the temple. You cannot get a greater level of Sinachinam than that. And it was that event that eventually invited the Romans to come in. Pompey walks in, in the year 63, marches into Jerusalem. Remember Pompey, the big pompous magnus, the big Roman general that had conquered everything. He's based in Syria. He comes into Jerusalem. He marches through the city. He marches up these steps probably through the, you know, smashes his way through the Sorig, which was the wall that was supposed to keep out the Gentiles, walks in. Some stories have that he actually had a couple of hookers on each arm, walks into the temple, bang, rips open the Kodesh Kodeshim, walks in, and then walks out and goes, but there's nothing in there. And we, of course, went, duh, that's the whole point. Of course there's nothing in there. It's the Holy of Holies. We have an incorporeal, invisible God. Pompey was astonished out of his mind. He couldn't believe it. You just hold temple like there's nothing in your holy of holies. It should be something like idol or something. You know. <laughs> Pompey, of course, decides in favor of Yochanan Hyrcanus, and Yochanan Hyrcanus has an assistant who is ruling. Well, one of his councils, big guy, descendant of the Idumean conversion, who is here, who is Antipater, sometimes called Antipasta, and he, of course, is a powerful ruler. He has a son, his son, who is running around in the Galilee making a nuisance of himself, eventually summoned before the Sanhedrin because he's wiped out quite a few too many people and he's called to account. And the Sanhedrin actually decides that the young Herod, who's only about 25 years old now, is worthy of the death sentence. And then they all go, oh no, but we can't do that because his dad's a really powerful figure and we're going to be bring trouble upon ourselves. It was Shammai who stood up and said, you cannot afford not to apply the law because it will come back upon you. And then they said, you know what, you're right, let's, let's, let's execute him. And then Yohanan Hyrcanus runs down to the Sanhedrin and says, stop the trial, stop the trial. Herod gets out and eventually Herod, whose most brilliant, brilliant ability was to pick winners, realized, don't forget the Parthians are now coming here, Parthia is now on the rise, it's coming in to try and take over, but Herod allies himself completely with Rome, and has that confirmed again, first of all by the Rome, after the death of Caesar, you know that the, the triumvirate divided up the whole area, Mark Antony was the ruler here, confirmed first of all by Mark Antony, and subsequently of course by Octavian who went on to become Augustus. I had to run through that in a minute. What I really needed to talk about, and I've got minus 30 seconds, I know that, and I don't like to hold people, is the fact that Herod, despite the fact that he was a psycho, and despite the fact that he was probably made Stalin look like a picnic, killed everyone who was close to him, wiped out his family, wiped out his wives, his kids, everyone. You only had to sneeze at Herod and he'd wipe you out. Built the Beit HaMikdash. Brick by brick. And in order to do that, without affecting a rebellion amongst the people, he sat down with the rabbis and he said, how can I do this? And every single instruction they gave him, he followed to the letter. They trained 1,000 kohanim to be workmen on the sacred places. They didn't use metal in cutting the stones for the Mizbeach and so on. They did everything to halacha. They used screens so that the korbanot would still be ongoing. And he built, whereas Yerushalayim is built out of Jerusalem stone, as you know, and the walls, you have to realize what he did. That big platform we call Harabaya today, that is a massive engineering feat. He basically filled in the side of that entire mountain. He built the temple out of pristine white marble. It was really a stunning building. It took years. Some say it took nine years to actually build, but they were still doing the finishing touches some 80, 90 years later when the temple itself was destroyed. So it was a massive building project and Herod actually at times had to do certain things to stave off rebellion and starvation because of everything was poured into the rebuilding of the temple. It was a huge project. Obviously, I wish I had more time to go on to it, but by the time we get to zero, and all I'm doing tonight is really setting up for next week. Herod is dead. Now, one of the things, Herod died in minus four. I just, I have to repeat this. I've said it before, but I have to repeat it. The last decree of Herod. Many people think that the last decree of Herod was in fact to have his son Antipater executed which, as you know, is most people's last decree. Please have my son taken out and get shot. Right? No, don't worry. But in fact, it wasn't. Herod's last decree 
was to take, you see, when he rebuilt the temple, Herod insisted, Herod was a complete vassal to Rome, totally. He's supported by Rome. Rome was the entire underpinning of his strength. And Rome, to him, represented the future of the Jewish people. He decided that when the temple was complete, he would have put on its facade a massive golden eagle as a symbol of subservience to Rome. And the rabbis came to him and said, look, Herod, you've done everything right about this temple. Don't spoil it now. Don't put the golden eagle on the gates. Not golden eagle, subservience to Rome, going on the gates. Three days before Herod carks it, he's lying there. And they go, thinking he's about to die. And, but at Job in Margalit and another time, they take and they organize for the Roman eagle to be taken down off the gates. And with his last breath, Herod orders those guys that took down the golden eagle to be found, brought out to the public square and burnt. Such was Herod's submission to the idea of Rome. Because Rome is definitively now in town. Herod dies and I'm going to pick that up next week. I, I apologise that I had to do the last hundred years super quick. There is a lot more information I wanted to go into, but that's, we're getting up to zero. So next week, we're going to lead up to the awful disaster events that led to the destruction of the temple that we still mourn. So thank you. Thank you for listening. To find out more about David Solomon's books, recordings and classes, or to support his work and teachings for just a few dollars a month, visit davidsolomon.online.